So welcome everyone to uh, SG STEM Talk and Trivia. My name is Marcus. And we have my co-host who is... Hi guys, I'm Kanan. How's everyone doing? And tonight we are uh, very lucky and honored to have with us uh, Dr. Jessica Lee, who is a uh, wears many hats at uh, Wildlife Reserve Singapore. She's Assistant Director for Conservation. Uh, she's the Secretariat for the for WRSCF, a Wildlife right. Reserve Singapore Conservation Fund that uh, quite a lot of our trivia pot has gone to. Um, she's in charge of conservation research and veterinary services at WRS and also coordinator for the IUCN Helmeted Hondu Working Group and the Asian Songbird Trade and Specialist Group. So many. Uh, so uh, she's going to tell us more about her, her role in uh, conservation in WRS together with the, some of the programs that uh, the WRS actually do that we might not know about. So uh, please take it away, Jess. Will do. Thanks for the lovely introduction and for inviting me um, to this uh, session and for everyone who's made time to sort of listen in. Um, I'm working on two screens, so I'm not, if I'm not looking at the camera, uh, that's the reason why. So I'm here to talk to you a bit about uh, what we do. Um, and what I do. So before I go into what I do, which I think, um, I mean, I, I quite like what I do. So I'll, I'll, I hope you guys will feel the same way after the, hearing what I have to say. But I'll also give you an idea of what we do as an organization at the start so that, you know, this whole thing flows in very nicely and in context. Um, so my, I've been working with birds for quite a long time, back in 2007. Um, a lot of my work has been uh, largely in Australia, but in the last six years I've come back to Singapore and obviously found myself working not only here, but also in this part of the world generally. Um, and now, as I said, we need to put everything in context. Um, and the context here that we're talking about is Southeast Asia. So as many of you know, uh, Southeast Asia is our backyard, our neighborhood. Um, we're not only right smack in the middle of this very diverse uh, you know, landscape, it's, it's not only diverse in terms of tradition and culture and religion and languages and stuff, but it's also highly threatened. Um, and Southeast Asia is one of those hotspots, it's a, it's a hotspot for not only people, but also threats. And I've only just listed a few of threats, right? The, the list actually goes on. At the same time, Southeast Asia is renowned for its really high levels of biodiversity and really high levels of endemism. Now, what that means, as many of you already know, um, is that the many animals found here that's not found anywhere else in the world. So that makes this region all the more important for conservation because it's got lots of people, lots of threats, but also lots of animals. And that combination together makes it a hot spot for species extinctions. Hence our focus, and, and Southeast Asia really is the focus of Wildlife Reserve Singapore, or WRS, as I, I will abbreviate this um, throughout my presentation. Now, um, our mission, as you can tell, I've highlighted the, the most important part in green, is really to, is, is, is to protect biodiversity, not only in Singapore, but also in Southeast Asia. And how do we rescue species um, from extinction? And this goes beyond you know, our, our operations as a zoo, which is to provide um, meaningful, marvel experiences for our guests and people who visit us. Um, this is a little summary of all our conservation pillars and our organization. Now, Many of you would already be aware of uh, what we do in terms of education and outreach, sustainability, all our XC2 conservation breeding programs, and all the really cool animals that we have in our collection, but also what we do for local wildlife, right, in Singapore. You know, and it goes beyond things like uh, wildlife rescue and rehabilitation. We, are also, um, we have also got three other arms that you know, I will be sharing uh, to a bit more detail uh, tonight. And that is our in situ conservation work that we do in this um, area that's Southeast Asia. And what all that, you know, on the right hand side highlighted is about. So conservation for us has been around for quite a fair, you know, quite, quite, quite a long time, but really in the last six years, that has seen the ramping up of our efforts in Southeast Asia. In, in, in six years, we've really supported um, over 200 conservation efforts in this part of the world. Um, that's broken down into 150 field projects supported, 60 capacity building initiatives um, hosted, as well as us stepping in to assist with regard in, in wildlife um, emergencies. All in all, we've spent close to $9 million um, in conservation in this last six years. And this, this comes up to be between 1.5 to 2 million a year when you divide it across that time period. And um, what this means is all the work they've put in has seen 
more than 80 threatened species are positively impacted in Southeast Asia. So I'll talk a bit about our projects. This entire talk is going to be bird focused, but of course we work on more than just birds. Um, if we just look at our work last year, right, of uh, uh, um, FY19-20, uh, we've, we've supported more than 40 projects uh, in Southeast Asia. And, you know, it's as far up as Laos, Vietnam, uh, Philippines, Cambodia, right across the board from, you know, the north, south, east and west of Southeast Asia. All of our projects uh, involve threatened um, Southeast Asian species. What it means is, you know, all of them fall under one of three categories of threat, either you're vulnerable, endangered or critically endangered, and that I use on a red list below. Two thirds of our project goes to support CR species or critically endangered species, about a quarter into endangered species and just over 10% um, for vulnerable species. But we do more than just provide financial support to um, projects in Southeast Asia. We're also big on this, what we call capacity building or building up uh, conservation competency in people. Because it's one thing to give a man a fish, as you may have heard this before, it's something else to teach a man to fish. So we're all about teaching people to fish, right? And to carry out conservation work so that work continues, work becomes ongoing and you know, we don't have to keep, people don't have to keep coming in, right, to, to help out. Uh, our organization and our conservation strategy is aligned with the global IUCN strategy and we adhere to the one plan approach, which essentially is how do we effectively preserve and conserve species um, with both in situ and ex situ um, conservation methods. Uh, and we did this, this entire one plan approach or this strategy is the whole assess plan and act. So meaning you do a proper, you know, species assessment before you plan for actions. And once you've generated actions from your plan, you carry out those actions. And all these things become measurable because it's not just funding work and doing work. It's, it's the work that we're doing actually benefiting the species. And how do we measure that? And increasingly these types of, um, you know, this type of evaluations is becoming more and more important, which is why we are following this um, approach. Now, part of our um, building up the, this conservation competency and capacity in Southeast Asia is to create this network, a conservation network or hub or support system um, to do so. And that is two, through two um, IUCN arms. If you can see my mouse, I'm trying, I'll try my best to circle it. That is the IUCN SSC or the Species Survival Commission's Conservation Planning Specialist Group, uh, as well as the Red Listing Hub. Now, what it, what it means is we will work together, I mean, the Southeast Asia with the hub center in Singapore at WRS, right, um, for both red listing activities, but also conservation and plant plan activities. With this hub centered here, not only do we, you know, uh, build capacity here, but we connect people working in Southeast Asia to the world because we report back to the various global offices and hopefully act as a conduit or, or a channel, right, for more effective conservation action and reporting. And this is just some examples of action plans that uh, we have either supported and or were involved in. Three of them at the top are local action plans, the Bennett Langer, the Crab and the Pangolin. But the other, other four, uh, five are um, regional action plans for species that are found elsewhere um, in Southeast Asia. We're also hosting an IUCN um, initiative and that's this Asian Species Action Partnership or um, ASAP. Now, what, what that's about is, is, is a, it's a coalition that's focused on uh, critically endangered uh, species, but specifically terrestrial and freshwater vertebrates. And you have to be Southeast Asian to fall under this ASAP category. The coalition is made up of over 100 partners across the world. It's hosted at WRS. And if you look at the number of CR species in Southeast Asia, it's, it comes up to 227 species that need help in this part of the world. And of that, of that number, a staggering 80% are found nowhere else in the world but Southeast Asia. So there's a lot of work that has to be done. And ASAP, uh, every, every now and then, they produce guidelines like um, the st uh, uh, strategy as well as action for ASAP species, uh, fish species, to help facilitate and guide conservation work um, in Southeast Asia. Okay, so I've talked a lot about the left side of the screen, um, which is the red listing uh, arm, the ASAP and the conservation planning arm that's hosted by uh, our organization. Um, and in doing so, we report to various other global conservation authorities like Wildlife International, the IUCN, the, the Species Survival Commission's office, as well as the Asian Regional Office. 
Increasingly now we're reporting to CITES because a lot of animals we work with are trade relevant and maybe moving forward even CBD, the Convention of Bi Biological Diversity. Now I'm going to talk, now in, in trying to give you an idea of what I do every day, um, I'll, I'll, I'll touch on, uh, on the bird projects that we do and hopefully that gives you um, some, some insights into my, uh, my everyday lives. So the two other IUCN groups we host here at WRS is the Asian Songbird Trade Specialist Group and the Hongbo Specialist Group. Now very quickly, the Hongbo Specialist Group, um, it's, it's broken down to Asian and Africa. Uh, we support the Asian arm uh, naturally. And what the Specialist Group is about is it's, it's there as a conservation authority to guide and promote conservation research uh, on Hongbo species and to figure out what animals, what species require help. Now, what that means is every year they review all the hornbills in Asia. These are just a, a few of them. And we've really created action plans for the helmet hornbill at the top, the Sulu hornbill, as well as the Mindoro and the Visayan hornbill. Moving down the list, the question is, do we need to start looking at action planning for the other three Asian hornbills that are currently um, EN or NT? And also, do we need to review their red list status? Are they you know, more threatened than their current uh, status, you know, uh, make, make them out to be. So these are some of the things that the Humble Specialist Group is involved in and we sort of help facilitate as the host. Um, under the Humble Specialist Group is the Helmet and Humble Working Group, which is a, a working group that's formed um, together with an action plan, a 10-year action plan across a range of the, of the Hondo, which comprises of five countries, Brunei, Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, and Myanmar, as well as transit and consumer countries um, in the trade. So this entire working group is coordinated by myself and Anuch from Belife International. Uh, we work with the various uh, leads at the top. So we've got conservation themes, right? Trade, research, habitat, and capacity building. All these leads work with us and the various range state facilitators below. And together we try to implement this action plan as much as we can across the range of the Hondo. Now, uh, for many of you on this call who think uh, conservation is, you know, uh, tracking lions in Africa, I can tell you the bulk of conservation work happens behind the screen on a computer. <laughs> and um, a lot of times our meetings, our, you know, monthly or quarterly meetings happen over, uh, over Skype or online, right? We catch up to talk about progress for um, the conservation of a particular species. Um, Anush and myself also, through these various updating sessions and meetings, we then put all these action plans, all, all the action items into this spreadsheet that looks really complicated. But the whole idea is to see how much progress have we made for the Helmet at Hornbill in the last two, three years. Have we, you know, um, gone as far as we hoped for or are we still far behind? And if we are far behind, what's lacking, right? What do we need to do to mitigate that? So. Ultimately, what we hope to see is some, something like this, right? It's this sheet that tells us on the status of the different uh, actions that's ongoing. And, you know, after 10 years, can we say, yep, we've done our job, we've saved the Humboldt Conville, it's no longer critically endangered, it's now um, near threatened. That's where, that, this is what this whole thing is about. And that's why the Assess, um, Plan and Act system that we follow is so important. Because we, as I mentioned earlier, report to other agencies like the intergovernmental government, organization societies and there's a lot of things that have to be done in order to conserve the species that is beyond us beyond the zoo beyond singapore the last specialist group that we host is the asian songbird trade specialist group um, myself and serene from traffic are coordinators of this particular group It's also a multi-international group and just like the helmet of humble working group we have an action plan that we're here to what we do as a specialist group every top two years is to assess the species that we work, we work with. Five years ago, we identified 28 species that need protection. Just last year, that list went up to 44 and will most likely increase with time. And every year we meet up, we need to reassess the needs of the species and how do we go about carrying out conservation action. As coordinators of the group, Sarin, myself, Anuj, we often also represent the IUCN uh, specialist group at various international platforms. So some of the questions we may ask ourselves, um, because we also subscribe to CITES uh, with regards to songbird trade, is for example, should a straw that bobo move from CITES 2 to CITES 1 because it's being more, you know, the trade is increasing. Should the white rum shama, the hill miner, the fairy bluebird, birds we see in the trade, should all these birds also go into a CITES list? None of these birds are CITES listed. So should we actually start looking at putting them on a list so that their trade is regulated and the species is protected? 
apart from the listing on CITES, we also uh, read this for a species, and that's essentially assessing them and saying, is a bit more threatened or less threatened than before. Okay, so that's really um, the entire network conservation, um, you know, hub thing that I've sort of mentioned earlier. I'm going now into um, what I do also, <laughs> the other half of the time, if I'm not managing specialist groups and working groups, I'm also um, trying to manage all our bird projects in Southeast Asia. Now we support about 15 projects out of our 45. So that's about a third of our projects actually, you know, um, it's, it's dedicated to um, birds. And from the maps, you can see already the two countries that come out very clearly as hotspots, and that uh, that is the uh, that, that are the Philippines and Indonesia, which also which are the two um, avian diverse countries in Southeast Asia. So, what do I do when it comes to uh, managing all these uh, different bird projects that we support? Um, to summarize it very quickly, really, it's to see how we can uh, direct and put funding in where it's needed. It's to also provide uh, support with regards to conservation work or strategic support and providing advice to various groups who want to carry out um, conservation actions on the ground, but also more importantly now strengthening this network and the partnership, this conservation web, right? Um, conservation is like a web of life. Um, it's very interconnected. I've listed some stakeholders here, but this list goes on. It's not just government and academia, it goes beyond all these um, players. And no one organization can carry out conservation work on, it, on its own. So how do we together, right, more effectively work and help preserve um, species such as birds, right, in Southeast Asia? And just to give you an idea, this, this slide alone uh, shows you our various local and regional conservation partners. I mean, some of, some of them are very familiar to you, some are not, but this is a network we operate on. Um, and this is a network we're trying to continue to build, extend and strengthen. Okay, I briefly mentioned earlier, bulk of conservation work, more, more than half of the time, I'm stuck behind a computer, uh, talking to people online about strategic funding, um, talking to partners about their work and how things are going on the ground, and the various specialist groups that you know, we coordinate just to see what the progress is. But thankfully, um, I also have another role in the organization, and uh, the best way to sort of describe it is sort of a conservation field attaché. So I, I go out every now and then, uh, into the field to see what progress is, simply because a lot of our bird conservation work is guided by action plans that we coordinate. So that means traveling a lot on planes, questionable airlines in Indonesia. Um, I don't recommend flying on many of these airlines if possible. A lot of car rides, we're talking about, you know, easily 12 hour car rides at a minimum two hours if you're lucky. Um, and motorbike rides, which happens the, really the bulk of the time, um, in, at least in Indonesia and many parts of the world, because it's, it's easy to get around on a bike. Very uncomfortable, but easy. Uh. Recently, I found myself, um, oops, sorry. Let me try that again. Recently, I found myself getting on boat rides a lot, um, and that's because for many of the birds we work with, it's easier to see them from a boat um, instead of being in the forest under the canopy where it's just hard to see them. So um, yeah, these are just some of the oversea, over lake and rivers that we find ourselves right trying to navigate um, around. Now, apart from cars and planes and boats, obviously nothing beats your two legs when it comes to getting around. So there's a lot of walking. People here who work in the field in this, in this uh, forum know what I mean. Um, be it climbing 70 meter tall watchtowers, um, trying to make your way across a very steep cliff without falling meters below, um, climbing up really hilly terrains, uh, crossing streams, really arid dry areas, and trying to get on the bike, you know, on a, on a narrow ridge, right? A strip of land without falling over the sides. These are just some of the terrains that you sometimes find yourself in, uh, in, in the field. Um, and of course, right, nothing like the odd torrential rainfall in Southeast Asia um, that happens pretty much every single day. And when you get caught up in it, it gets extremely difficult. Or if you're on a boat and you find yourself getting stuck and having to push the boat and your passengers you know, quite a, a, a fair bit of the way. And 
the, I guess some of the perks of living in the field uh, or working in the field is, the, is to sample the various cuisine and accommodation options right, that's available to you from really small rooms where three or four people have to find themselves squeezing into uh, five-star research stations like the top left, um, toilets that use waterfalls as natural flushing systems, which I, I thought was quite amazing. Um, and also, you know, um, having local food in the field, which uh, some of the perks, I guess, that makes this um, the work worth it. But I think what's even more, um, you know, worthwhile, right, when it comes to all these things that we do in the field, it's really to see all the birds, um, be it threatened songbirds, hornbills, or the magnificent Philippine eagle. This, this really makes, um, you know, all that traveling and pain um, worth it. And I, I haven't even gone into like getting bitten by ticks and leeches yet, right, which is another layer of complications altogether. But it's not just fear work when we travel. Um, quite often, half the time, we find ourselves stuck in meetings. Um, and it's meetings after meetings after meetings, be it a conservation planning exercise, um, an updating session, talking with governments to try to secure their commitment to conserve species, going to conferences, or visiting other ex situ facilities like rescue centers and zoos to see you know, um, what, what's going on in those, in those arenas. Um, we also do a lot of capacity building. The, the two pictures at the bottom on the left shows you some of the, the workshops that we run um, in trying to also build capacity in the region as training people hands-on um, on how to handle animals. And I'm happy to say that um, I also am fortunate enough to get my hands dirty um, and work with animals besides attending meetings and you know, suffering the Southeast Asian uh, rainforest. I get to work with um, you know, rescued birds. So a lot of this work we do together with uh, uh, local partners like NPOX on you know, rescuing uh, wild eagles, putting a satellite tag on them and releasing them to see you know, where, where, where they go. And you know, if they go back to problem areas, we also um, work with uh, local authorities on the conservation of the green imperial pigeon, but because we don't have that in a collection, what we do is we use a proxy bird, the pine imperial pigeon, attach backpack trackers on them. And then what we, we then release these birds into uh, our aviaries to see how they fare. And, and then you can tell weeks later, the bird is still, is still flying around quite easily without any obstruction with the backpack in place. So this is the kind of what we also do. So it's not just, you know, your work is also hands-on work that, you know, like for example, if I get a chance to do it, I try, try, I try to do it because I find this hands-on work a lot of fun. Um, okay, now apart from everything that that's nice, right? Going to feel and all that. Quite often, we also work with um, NGOs that work in the trade. Uh, and I, I've gone out a few times as a consultant to do market surveys uh, with some of these NGOs, um, Vietnam, Indonesia. Some of it is in the open, like uh, the two pictures on the right that shows an uh, open market in Vietnam where nothing is hidden. And then in other countries, um, a lot of the birds, prize birds are hidden. And I have to hook myself up. I, get to, I have to be hooked up with a hidden microphone and a spy camera, which is this car key. So if, you, if people want to do what I cut the picture is there, that is actually the spy camera. So open, unlock is, is record and lock is stop recording. So that's how that camera works. And the footage below, the hidden camera footage is one of the footage I took while in, in a market in Indonesia. Um, yeah, it's quite scary actually when you go and do this. It's very nerve wracking. And Going the field, you know, seeing birds and stuff in the wild is amazing, but the other side of the coin is obviously the not so nice side of, um, of you know, uh, wildlife and humans, and that is things like the trade. I've seen, you know, birds, dead birds piled up in, in the pet shops, right? Birds stuff into horrible conditions. Um, and, you know, sometimes you may wonder just, is all this worth it, right? This trade is so rampant, is all your work on the ground actually worth it? And I find myself really tired. That's a really bad picture of me after flying and, and traveling and not having rest for two days. Um, and, and it is tiring. But I guess when I think about all the landscapes I get to see uh, when I go in the field, this beautiful landscapes that still exist, right? They still require protection. When I think about all the people that dedicate their entire lives, right, into conserving the species, right, day and night, right, almost every day of the week. Um, and I think of the birds, right, or in this year, birds and other animals that, you know, hopefully through our efforts, right, will fly free again. 
I think it's all worth it. And that's why, that's why I'm here. That's why um, WS organization is still committed to conservation in Southeast Asia, because this is where we're all aiming for. It's this future, right? Um, where, where humans and, and wildlife can coexist quite, quite happily. And that's it. That's actually the end of my talk. I hope I am, I made the time limit because uh, I was, I, I, yeah, I couldn't see the chat screen. So um, yeah. Uh, thank you, Jess. Uh, and yes, you did make the time limit. I hope I wasn't too fast. I apologize no, if I it was. Wasn't. <laughs> no, it was. I didn't think it was fast. It, it was good. And um, thank you for the great talk. Uh, we do have a bunch of questions. Okay, sure. So I'm just gonna. Oops. Do I still share my screen or I, I, I uh, can leave it? You can leave it or you can just like, you no, know, take it off. I, I think you leave it. It's fine. I'll share mine later when okay. we get to it. So we have a bunch of questions. Um, we just pull them up. Yeah. Firstly, uh, oh, oh dear, oh dear, where did the chair? There we are. Uh, Sinway wants to know how do you justify the role of zoos in 21st century in a world where keeping uh, animal captive animals is a whole ethical issue? And like, how can you how can you convince people that zoos are still relevant and have a role to play? So I guess he means like in addition to the conservation roles that you have mentioned so far. Yeah. So um. I can only speak for myself, I guess, and maybe for some people who are here. Uh, the reason why I'm, I spent my last 15 years working in wildlife is also because I was impacted by Singapore Zoo as a kid growing up, being exposed to these animals as a child, and then realizing that, you know, I, this is where I want to be. And I spent my, my entire life, the last, you know, um, 20 years of my life, carving this, 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 this um, path for myself, whether it was in Australia or in, in Singapore, it's really, and, and having an organization, I guess, I do agree, m m many zoos across the, the world, Southeast Asia, some zoos, you know, in other countries in our region could do better. Uh, you know, the, the standards of welfare still require so much improvement. And this is what we do too. So what I haven't touched on here is, apart from the in situ work, our ex situ arm is actually working with all the zoos in Southeast Asia to become, to become modern conservation organization and moving away from what zoo, what, what the word zoo means, right, this captive facility, to a conservation powerhouse. How, how do we get, and, and, and our entire capacity building and, and building up conservation co uh, competency in Southeast Asia is, is heading towards in that, that direction. And I'm happy to do another presentation on the XC2 what we do, but, you know, it's, I don't have time to do that. But it's all about building capacity and ensuring zoos in the region do the right thing, um, because we can do, we, we have the ability to do the right thing, um, spreading the word. Uh, raising awareness amongst people, um, changing the, the lives of young kids, right, to become future conservationists in the field, but operating properly as an organization with animals under your care. Um, and like I said, it's, it's not just education and, and, and advocacy and awareness raising, but zoos also have uh, instrumental roles in having assurance colonies of species that require human intervention. Conservation is in C2 and XC2, um, right? It requires both arms. So the XC2 arm will always be there. How do we get the NC2 XC2 arm to work harmoniously together, right? Strategically and effectively. Um, okay. Yeah. Thank you, Jess. Um, the next, uh, Angelia wants to know how much progress has been made in the conservation of birds in the past year? Huh. You see, that's why tracking action plans are so important. I can't give you a number <laughs> right now because we're still in the process of, of, of tracking. But I, I dare say it has, it, it has certainly in the last 10 years, and not going to just Southeast Asia, but in Singapore also, right? It has, it has gone up by leaps and bounds. I feel like many countries that we work with, Philippines and Indonesia, are way more advanced than, you know, we sometimes give them credit for, you know, and, and the work they're doing on the ground. And if, if, they're, if, they're, if, they, if there's anyone who knows the species best, it's them. So, yeah, I actually think we have made quite a fair of progress, at least from a you know, collaboration and networking site. And so now the question is, how do we, you know, start effectively saving species and getting all these action plans, right, um, ongoing, and then we can track progress and measure things more effectively in the future. Uh, Nazri wants to know, how can someone participate in some of these conservation projects? Well, that's a question uh, we always get. Um, and I won't, I mean, the, the usual would be you can volunteer the zoo and all that. I mean, everyone here in this call knows that option exists. 
um, having said that, there are a lot of these rescue centers and facilities that we work with across Southeast Asia do take in volunteers. Um, so if there is interest, you may actually reach out to them individually, um, donate to them. That's very helpful. Quite often money is what unfortunately make, makes the world go around and it makes the conservation go, world go around too. So true donations, you can help. But if you'd like to commit your time, you could sign up for some of these um, some of these NGOs that actually have volunteer programs because they need all the help they can get. Okay, thank you. Um, Danu wants to know, how does WRS ensure sustainability of these projects in Southeast Asia? Uh, because it's always a challenge in ground level projects due to funding and uh, long-term commitment to it. And how will these uh, economic impacts of, co how will the economic impacts of COVID-19 affect these projects? I can tell you the economic, I mean, COVID-19 has severely impacted a lot of our projects in Southeast Asia, not just financially. So a lot of them have lost money because, um, so zoos, are, zoos as, a, as a group of organizations quite often fund a lot of these projects and COVID-19 because, because of, 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 of how it's impacted zoos, a lot of zoos have, you know, in the end, not being, not, were not able to fund projects. So, so we have, thankfully our, 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 our organization has said, Yes, and we're still committed to our partners. So we're still funding our partners, uh, even this year, even though we're closed and not getting any revenue, we're still committed to our, our uh, regional partners. But um, it, it goes down really to, so zoos operate on public and guests entering them. And a lot of the funding that we get, right, the revenue we get from people visiting our parks actually goes into conservation. So when you visit any of our four parks, when you buy a ticket or get a drink or buy a gift for someone, you are actually supporting conservation work. So it, it's true working with members of the public in that, in that way, that's how we fund our projects. But moving forward, we're also in the process of seeing if we can, you know, create a foundation that where we can have a stable source of um, funding that will go into okay. projects. Yeah, that, that, that's where we're headed towards at this point okay. in time. That's good to know. Um, right, I think we'll do two more questions. Uh, for, firstly, because there are two questions on this, so I'm just going to compress them. Firstly, Azari wants, Azahari wants to know, songbirds are still being reared and caged in Singapore. Why can't this be banned? And on a similar note, Liz is asking, are you aware of the local bird supply that sells exotic birds like black palm cockatoo, cockatoo and hornbills as pets? And what is being done about it? Or, or what will be done about it? Yes, um, we are very much aware of um, a lot of these activities that happen. I mean, not only in Singapore, um, we see Asian birds popping up in American and European markets too. And quite often we are contacted to, we're calling to assist um, in, in managing those processes. Um, it's, I think it's very important for us being in Singapore, but also in Southeast Asia to understand that things like somber king and keeping of some other animals, right? Are very, it's, it's a very cultural and traditional thing. And um, there's no answer to solving this somber issue or, or, or pet keeping because it's, it's centuries old. Um, so. What we, what we really need to do is actually um, understand the, the drivers and, and, and the motivations behind the trade and, and see if we can find ways to change behavior and therefore change mindsets and hopefully get people out from keeping all these animals. And, and that means just strategically working with, in Singapore, for example, local partners like NPARCs, NSS, and all these other conservation organizations here, but also with government and non-government partners in other parts of the world where the trade also happens and seeing what's the best way and how do we sensitively, you know, um, step in and try to change things. Okay. There's no answer yet. <laughs> yeah. I wish there was. Because I guess, like you said, it's a culture thing and it probably takes a lot of like, there are probably several levels to like getting it across, the message across to people. You can't undo 200, 300 years of culture right, in, in one day or one week. So how do we do it pro <laughs> properly? That's true. Yeah. All right, so uh, let's take the last question from Tom. When doing investigations such as market surveys, are you confident that the, are you confident that the physical risk and legal risk you face are managed? Yes. So quite often um, when we do do some of these surveys, uh, depending on where you are in the world, um, for example, in Vietnam, it's not illegal to do it. So we can go in quite easily to do it. In some other parts of the world, um, it's, not, 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 it's, not, it's not legal, it's just not, Good if you do it because of, of some issues that so that's why spy, spy cameras and spy whatever right the microphones are so important and how you need to act when you're when you're assessing a market is also very important um, the areas that we work with thankfully aren't too dangerous at, at the very most we get plucked out and sent out and you know not allowed to come back to the market 
But in other parts of the world, it actually gets quite dangerous. So uh, we operate with local partners uh, when we do all these things. So we ensure that um, people are informed, the right people are informed when we do these things so that we don't get implicated uh, negatively later on for going in and doing it. Okay. Yeah, there is, the, there is a process. Okay, thanks. Uh, okay, I mean, I mean, I know I said the last question, right? But this is a personal question of mine. When you go out on this, like, missions and stuff, right? Like, um, spy cam missions, do you have, like, a little theme tune that you have in your head? If so, what is it? <laughs> That's a good question. I actually don't have a tune. Half the time, I'm like, am I holding the spy camera in a, in a proper <laughs> way that people won't, won't know that I'm recording? Yeah, no, I don't. I don't have a tune. I should think about that because it will drown out all the bad yeah. noise. Probably, Thanks. you know, it'd be really cool I, as well. <laughs> I will take that on board and I will be sure to tell you the next time I go on. Excellent. I'd love it. to hear it. All right. Uh, anyway, that is all the questions from me. Uh, yeah. Do you have anything, Marcus? Uh, no, I don't because you've got a great uh, finish at the end. But, um, uh, okay, my computer has uh, restarted itself, so I can't unmute everyone, I think, uh, easily. Uh, but let's see how I can do this from here. Okay, I'm going to unmute all of you, and I hope all of you could um, join me in thanking Jess for her wonderful talk. But don't go away after this. Uh, I'm going to unmute all of you first. All right, so thank you, Jess. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Dr. Jessica. Thanks for staying. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Dr. Jess is so cool. Oh, <laughs> I know who said that. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to mute all of you now. Thanks so much, Jess. Um, yeah. and... All right, so we're going to move on to the next uh, segment, which is um, our trivia. So uh, Jess would have to un uh, unshare her screen so that Kanan could share his. It's also a quick time for everyone to take a short break if they want to. But if you are ready for the trivia, then uh, please head to tinyurl.com slash sgstem dash trivia. Uh, fill up the trivia sheet and uh, we'll be ready to begin in a short while. Yep, uh, just give me a second. I'm just checking whether everything is all right. Okay. So I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll talk over uh, as, we, as we go on now. So for every trivia, uh, we have four rounds. Uh, three not ordinary rounds um, arranged around a certain team and the fourth round is a bonus round. And what happens is that um, you could play uh, by yourself solo or you could play with a team, uh, but we practice an honor code. You're not supposed to check the internet. You're not supposed to check books, but you can ask around your team members. And um, please head over to the Google form, indicate your team name as well as or you, your own name together with the selected beneficiary. So everyone's uh, encouraged to contribute to a trivia pot. Uh, you can do it now, you can do it later. So the screen's coming on now. Um, and at the end of the trivia, the winner or winners will decide um, where this uh, trivia pot money goes to. Okay. So uh, get your pen and paper or pencil and paper uh, or your word processor ready and we'll begin uh, in a while. Yep, probably in a couple of seconds now. Oh, there is a mistake on the live Google sheet. I don't know why now it says um, NUS dash, uh, it's, the, it's our Zoom room instead. It should say tinyurl.com slash sgstem dash trivia. Mm, yeah, uh, I'll, just put, I'll just put it down here in the chat as well, because it'll be easier for people. Yep. So at the end of the, uh, once we review the answers, we request that everybody uh, mark your own answers and send it to us. Uh, you take a, took a photo and send it to us and send it to us by email. And uh, we will check the winners and announce the winners uh, via email. Yeah. But we will announce an unofficial winner at the end of the session. So I think right, Marcus, ready. I'll, yeah, I'll start. And then you can just put the, uh, the link in the chat. Sure. The uh, tiny URL link for the uh, Google Sheet. So for the first one, it is science fiction. Oh, by the way, this week's um, three-letter acronym is SGP for Singapore, because we were kind of like running low on um, acronyms here. So you guys are welcome to give us your acronym suggestions. So science fiction, let's go. 
what is the name of the submarine vessel in Jules Verne's 1870 novel, 20,000 Leagues Under the Seas? What is the name of the submarine vessel in Jules, Verne, Jules Verne's 1970 novel, 20,000 Leagues Under the Seas? And Marcus has just dropped the, uh, the link for Google Sheets. Uh, if you haven't done it already. Moving on. Oh. Moving on. Uh, which of the following is the main crop in The Martian by Andy, Andy Ware? I think, yeah. Which, which of the following is the main crop in The Martian by Andy Ware? A, tomatoes. B, apples. C, mushrooms. D, potatoes. Tomatoes, apples, mushrooms, and potatoes. What would you like yeah. to eat in space most? Steak. <laughs> <laughs> or like from Wally, -E, pizza plants. So yeah. Jen has asked why is this not MCQ? I assume it was the first question. I felt like using MCQ would be a giveaway because I could not think of um, options. We sounded close to each other. So yeah. Moving on. Which of the following authors invented the word robot? Which of the following authors invented the word robot? A, Isaac Asimov. B, Carol Kapak. C, H.G. Wells. And D, John W. Campbell. Which of the following sci-fi authors invented the word robot? Isaac Asimov, Carol Kapak, Karel Kapak, H.G. Uh, Wells, and John W. Campbell. We hope there are some uh, sci-fi buffs out there. Yeah. As for answers, you can like put them on a piece of sheet, uh, on a sheet of paper or something, or separately on a, on a message, and then send it to us the email at the end. We do not have an answer sheet for this, like a place to fill up the answers. Moving on, if I can, this is quite a big question. So, yeah, it's a bit of a long question. Apple, Apple. Apple famously sued Samsung over patent rights claiming the latter's tablet computer is too similar to their design. Samsung, as a defense, used a science fiction to defend itself in court. Which film or series did it use? A, Star Wars Episode Four, A New Hope, 1977. 2001, A Space Odyssey, 1968. Star Trek, 1966 to 1969. Or Aliens, 1986. Which of these films or series did Samsung use as a defense against Apple over patent rights on the tablet computer? Yeah. I think the lawsuit was uh, sometime in the early 2010s and they actually played a clip of the movie in, in court, which is super funny. I'm, I'm sure everyone just enjoyed it. Right? They're like, oh, look, we're watching a movie today. Yay. It's like when you're in school and your teacher's like, today we'll watch a film and everyone gets so happy. I, I assume it's like that. Yeah. Check out okay. those tablets on, on the table. Yeah, next question. Yeah, we'll move on. Yes, of course, there is a question on Jurassic Park, which is, funnily enough, not my question, it's Marcus's question. In the Jurassic Park and Jurassic World franchise, Isla Blank is the name of the island that is an attraction with dinosaurs that tourists can visit. In the Jurassic Park and Jurassic World franchise, Isla Blank is the name of the island that is an attraction with dinosaurs that tourists can visit. And the answer is not uh, Isla Fisher. That's an actress, not the island. Okay, moving on. As usual, right, if you guys need me to go back to a question or want me to hold on for a while, uh, maybe you want to see Rexy roaring again and again. You let me know and I'll just pause on it for a while. Okay, and of course we have to keep with, uh, with uh, current themes and so it's gonna be general elections. I hope you guys remember your social studies lessons. As of the revision of the electorates of, on 15 April, 2020, 
there are blank GRCs and 14 SMCs in Singapore. As of the revision of the electorates on 15 April 2020, there are blank GRCs and 14 SMCs in Singapore. You can name them in your mind right now. It will help you. I don't think I can name that many. Well, there are 93 seats that are up for election this uh, general election. So you could try minusing 14 and do your permutations. I see Gretel using a calculator. <laughs> is, is, that, is that a clue? Should people be reaching for the calculators now? He's messing with them. <laughs> Question two. General elections in the Singapore must be held within blank after five years. After five years have elapsed, elapsed from the date of the first sitting of a particular parliament in Singapore, which is to say, uh, after how long uh, must a general election be held after five years have passed from the last one? So, is it eight, three months, six months, nine months, or twelve months? Helps to read the newspaper. For how trivia. I mean, to be like honest, right? I had no idea of any of these things. These were like all of my research. My research came through. So from like the last week or so. So yeah. I mean, Marcus, if you knew all of this, right? Like, without having to research, good on you, man. Good on you. Nope, I have no idea about this. <laughs> All right, uh, question three. In which year did Singapore hold its first general elections? In which year did Singapore hold its first general elections? A, 1960, B, 1959, C, 1965, uh, D, 1956. So what does this picture depict? It is the people queuing up to cast their votes on the actual day. Like this is from the actual first election, general election. Wow. Imagine how, how, how it differs on what's going to happen on, on the 10th. Yep. With social distancing, yeah. Like, I was trying to look at the picture and like look at places, but I was like, I couldn't even like listen where this thing could be. And I was going to be like, oh, this picture was taken at blah, blah, blah place, but I couldn't guess it at all. And uh, the image didn't have any other details. The only other detail they had was the, the date itself, which I removed, so yeah. Yeah, no idea. Right, moving on. Which political party's 2020 manifesto mentions the, mentions the term biodiversity? Which political party's 2020 manifesto, which is this coming elections manifesto, mentions the term biodiversity? <clears throat> yeah. Helps to read the party manifestos too. Yeah, you know, like if you want to join SG STEM, right, you've got to read papers, you've got to read party manifestos. You got to see the kind of stuff that Marcus and I post on our Twitter and Facebook because that's where we get our ideas from. Yeah. Uh, maybe I'll do a plug. Uh, so if you're interested about different party manifestos and how they relate to the environment and biodiversity, um, Audrey Tan, one of our previous speakers, actually reviews each party's manifestos um, on Twitter. Uh, so do check her out or check out um, Isabella from CNA who does that too. Let's move on. Says basically stop us. Yeah, move on. Yeah. <laughs> what is the day before polling day where there is a prohibition against election campaigning during a 24-hour period to give voters time to reflect rationally on issues called? What is the day before polling day where there is a 24 there's a prohibition against election campaigning during a 24-hour period to give voters time to reflect rationally on issues called? And apparently uh Candidates are not supposed to post on social media even relating to campaigning. Someone said happy hour. Yeah, happy good idea. Hour. <laughs> happy hours more like. 
All right. Uh, I think that was good. Let's go to the last one, Pokemon. Yes, this was uh, Gretel's idea. So if you guys got qualms, you can take it up with Gretel. Ha. I see Nazri uh, shaking his fist up in the air. I don't know whether it's angry or happy. <laughs> <laughs> Did we walk into a trap? Are they all like Pokemon geniuses? But don't oh, worry, Gretel's. right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for those of you who are not like too uh, Pokemon savvy, don't worry about it. We try to keep this thing as scientific as possible. What? Which of the following Pokemon is based on a real animal? Which of the following Pokemon is based on a real animal? A. Poliwag. B. Marill. C. Alakazam. D. Victribel. The first two just look like lollipops or candy, and the other two look like twisties. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> okay. So now we know that Marcus looks at them all like how he looks at food. Excellent. I mean, you didn't even go like one looks like a plant and two of them look like balls. You went like, they look like lollipops and like twisties. Okay. <laughs> yep, pretty hungry. Uh, the, their names are A is Poliwag, B is Meryl, C is Alakazam, and D is Victory Bell. Nice since, since ID. It, yeah, since it was like a, a physical thing, right, I didn't bother putting the names in. Maybe I should have. But yeah, Poliwag, Maril, Alakazam, like Magic Alakazam, and Victory Bell. Okay. Moving on. Oh, there's a lot of Pokemon in this one. What inspired Pokemon creator Satoshi Tajiri, I think I got the name right, Satoshi Tajiri, to create the game? A, bug hunting, B, keeping pets, C, fishing, and D, playing with friends. What inspired Pokemon creator Satoshi Tajiri to create the game? Bug hunting, keeping pets, fishing, playing with friends. Why, why the Chameleon look strange? They do. They don't seem to be uh, drawn according to scale as well. Yeah, they're not drawn according to scale. The Chameleon looks as if he was trying to hug someone and he got stopped. So, yeah. Thing is, when I post, first posted it, I was looking for Pikachu, but I couldn't find it. Let me know if anyone sees a Pikachu anywhere. But there's a Raichu on the bottom, so yeah. Yeah, the, the colors are quite faded on this one. Like, this wasn't like some original, like, Pokemon drawing thing. I just, like, tried to find a picture where there was a bunch of Pokemon just hanging around. Like, it's, it's mostly very faded. Like, look at this poor Dragonite. It's, it's almost disappeared, man. Someone needs to go to the Poké Center. Maybe they're all details. Maybe they're all details. Think about it. Aha, we found the Pikachu. Pikachurian is the common name given to a protein found in humans. True or false? Pikachurian is the common name given to a protein found in humans. True or false? Right, moving on, because we have a schedule to keep. I try to. Whalema and Waylord are the only two whale Pokemon in the series, as far as I know. Using their rock walls, which are like the grooves on the bottom of their neck, you guys can see it in the uh, image. Uh, as a real world comparison, are they Misty Seti or Odonto Seti whales? If Whaleman and Whalelot were real whales, would they be Mr. Seti or Odonta Seti whales? So you guys just got to pick either or. Is Wishcash not a whale? That's uh, Nazri's question. Uh, I, don't I don't think so. I think, Wish, I think Wishcash is a catfish because of its like whiskers. So yeah, I think it's a catfish. And I have no idea what, if, if, anyone, if anyone's going to ask me, I have no idea what Kaya Grey is. Uh, it doesn't look very whale-like, but at the same time, it looks kind of whale-like. So I'm like, let's not include legendary Pokemon in this, because we can't be too sure. See, I knew someone <laughs> would ask about Kyogre. I knew it, because I decided to go and look up like whale Pokemon. So yeah. By the way, right? Uh, whale Lord and Whale Ma, the big round things, not the little swimmy thing in there. So yeah, for those who are not familiar with Pokemon. Okay. 
Um, last question. Which of these was the first Pokemon ever designed? Which of these was the first Pokemon ever designed? A, Barbasaur, B, Mew, C, Rhydon, and D, Arceus. Which of these was the first Pokemon ever designed? I, I think this no yeah, idea. <laughs> this, this I think this is like the only true Pokemon question out there. I mean, in in our quiz, the rest of them are kind of like somewhat sciencey. I like to think so. Yeah. Is it wrong spelling for Rockwells? Uh, maybe I don't know. Uh, yeah, I think it's R O R Q U. Oh, uh, is is it two R's? Yeah. Uh, okay. Might be. So yeah. Always use a spell check, people. Always use a spell check. Do not be like me. Ah, uh, okay. R O R Q A Q A L. Okay. So quickly, I'm gonna run through the answers. Uh, let's go. Nautilus was the name of the submarine in 20,000 Leagues Under the Seas. Nautilus was its name. So please and, mark your answers accordingly. Yep, and send them to us later via email. Uh, potatoes were the main crop in the Martian. Potatoes. Boil them, stew them, stick them, boil them, boil them, mash them, stick them in the stew. Yep. And uh, although Isaac Asimov wrote The Three Laws of Robot Robotics, the word robot was invented by author Carol Ka Karel Kepek. That was the coolest picture I could find. And um, Samsung used 2001 as Space Odyssey from 1968 as its stand against, as a defense against Apple over the tablet suing. And Isla Nubla is where you can go for Jurassic Park and Jurassic World. Uh, if you can't, if you, if you've got Nubla in a in a spelling form, whatever, right, we'll still accept it. You don't have to spell it right exactly the way it is. As long as it looks on like Nubla, we good. As of the revision on of April twenty twenty, there are seventeen GRCs and fourteen SMCs in Singapore. This was when I last checked, like a few days ago. So if they have changed states, I wouldn't know. So there's thirty one of them all together, seventeen GRCs and fourteen SMCs. Yeah, and I caught a, apparently the people from Pulau Ubud would have to take a boat to the main island and then take a, another transport vehicle to their polling station. So imagine how much time they have to travel. Yeah, and they have to do it, and they will be part of the East Coast GRC. Uh, general elections in Singapore must be held within three months after five years have passed from the date of the first sitting. Three months, A is the right answer. And the first GE was held on 30th May, 1959. 30th May, 1959. Uh, SDP, Singapore Democratic Party, has been the only one so far to have a manifesto that mentions the term biodiversity. They were also the first uh, political party to release their manifesto uh, back in February this year. And the day before cooling off day, where there's a 24-hour prohibition against campaigning, is called cooling off day. Cooling off day is the answer. And yes, SDP is fine. I mean, even if you have drawn like the party's symbol, <laughs> yeah, we'll probably take it as well. <laughs> Pokemon answers, that should be the word answers here. It's not. Poliwag is based on a real animal. So a few species of uh, tadpoles have transparent bellies and the intestines are all prettily coiled up. So these guys are from Costa Rica. There's a couple of them in like uh, Central and South America and they, and they all have like coiled intestines in them. So yes, polywag is uh, based on a real animal. And bug hunting inspired the creator to create Pokemon bug hunting because he felt kids don't com commune with nature and don't go catch insects anymore. Pikachurian is a protein found in humans. 
uh, they named it Pikachu Ring because electricity or uh, it moves really fast or something. I can't remember. I probably should, but yeah, Pikachu Ring is real. And Whalema and Waylord are Mr. Seti or Berlin Whales. Berlin Whales? Berlin Whales? Yeah, so like blue whales and uh, humpback whales. So uh, cool fact. Place. Misty actually means a moustache and Ketty is a Greek word for a sea monster. So Misty Ketty is a moustache sea monster that refused to the baleen hairs from these whales. Nice. I didn't know that. Now I'll never look at whales the same way again. And Rhydon was the first Pokemon ever designed. Like they created Rhydon and then they were like, oh yeah, we'll create the rest of them. And this question is kind of weird away because Barbasaur is the first Pokemon in the Pokedex. Mew is the first Pokemon ever. And Arceus is the Pokemon god, if you follow the law and everything. But for this question, Rhydon is the first Pokemon ever designed. And now we'll go to the bonus round. Yep, so what um, I hope everyone could do is that uh, we're going to start the bonus round soon. So please tally and wager your points. So mark your points accordingly and go on to our uh, Google spreadsheet for this, for the SG STEM uh, trivia. We're going to put the link here again. Uh, tinyurl.com, SG STEM dash trivia. Uh, update your scores on the spreadsheet because we're going to need your scores uh, in a while. So how does the bonus round work? So as I see the spreadsheet being populated, we've got quite a few teams today. Um, it works by, um, as you play the bonus round, you have to wager your points before you actually play. So let's say if you got all the, all the categories, all the rounds correct, you have a total of 15 points. And you can wager from one point uh, all the way to 15 points, the maximum points you have. Uh, and what happens is that if you get the bonus question correct, you gain the number of points you wager. Or if you get a bonus question wrong, you lose the number of points you are wrong. So you could, if you've got 15 points, you wager all 15, you get 30 points. But if you get it wrong, you get zero points, right? So let's see uh, what the wagers are for the team, whether you're conservative or you want to live a bit dangerously. I see that almost uh, we've got 50% of the teams have wagered. We'll wait for all the wages to be on before we begin. Yep, let me know when we're good to go. Uh, we're just waiting for Eco Warrior. Okay, Eco Warrior is putting it in now. Okay, so we are good to go. All right, so uh, as those of you are regular players, you will know the bonus round comes from the the talk earlier, so this comes from Jess's presentation at the start of the session. How much in Singapore dollars has WRSCF, Wildlife Reserve Singapore Conservation Fund, contributed in support of conservation projects? How much has WRSCF contributed in support of conservation projects? I think it's uh, right in a couple of first few slides in the talk. Mm -hmm. are, are we going to give them like uh, the, the, the range or are we not going to give them the range? Yeah, the error, uh, accepted error value is 1 million. Yep. So it's got to be plus minus 1 million. Yep. So please uh, write down your answers and we will review the answers soon. See who's leading right now. Leading right now is Dr. Jess Fan Club. Let's see if you get the answers correct now. All right, so I think uh, we are ready to go on to review the answers. Okay. So good luck to everyone. SGD 8.7 million was contributed in support of conservation projects by the WRSCF. Yep. So we'll take anywhere from 7.7 .7 million to 9.7 .7 million in your answer. Yeah. Do, do you want to give them that extra mark if they get 8.7 on the dot? Uh, yeah, let's do it. Yeah, right. So as usual, you know, generous marks here. If you get 8.7 on the dot, you get an extra point plus one. If you get 
either uh, anything more or less than 8.7, uh, you do not get an extra mark. So yeah. It's just one point though. You don't get like double what you get, right? So yeah. yeah. I'm nice, but not that nice. Mm -hmm. So uh, while you guys are telling up, uh, uh, and that, uh, do you want to, Marcus, what's going on? What's the, uh, oh, how the uh, numbers looking? Uh, they're, they're filling it up, but maybe if you let them know, uh, look at the link on how to send the answers in to the next slide, that would be great. There we go. Yep. Yep. So please send us your answers. You could take a photo of it if you wrote it, wrote it down, or you could just type it out and send it to us via email uh, mm -hmm. at sgstem.toptrivia at gmail.com and update your scores, and we could announce the unofficial winner right away. Yeah, and for those of, you, those of you who are new and you're wondering like, oh, well, how does this like photo texting work? So what happens is now that they filled up the Google Sheet, Marcus will know like a unofficial winner. And later, once the session ends, Marcus and I will just go through like uh, all of the answers you guys send us and make sure that there are no like calculation errors and stuff. And um, yeah, we'll just confirm the winner. So far, our unofficial winner has always been the official winner as well. So we never had any issues. But it's yep, just like- you no. guys are or on very honest people. All right, so I think there's a, there's a twist and some drama and going on in the sheet. So uh, our unofficial winner uh, has 21 points and the team name is Jim People and the selected beneficiary is WRSCF. So nice. who is Jim People? Let us know in uh, Yeah, man, drop us like a chat. what word in the comments, yes. Yeah. So unfortunately, uh, Dr. Wait, wait, Jess's did, did, car. <laughs> did Jin people win because of the one mark? Yes, they did. Oh, everyone's going to hate me now. No. Yeah, REL is a close <laughs> second. Yeah, you guys didn't get a one mark. So well, congratulations. So um, the trivia part today would uh, go to WRSCF uh, once we check the, the results, which is great. Yep. And so, we'll also have to check like the pot. Yep. So thanks for joining us. We're going to review who our next speaker is um, for our next session. I'm yep. oh. excited to know that. Oh yeah. So this is go. a way to contribute to. Yep. So our next speaker uh, in two weeks' time on the 16th of July is Dr. To Tai Chong uh, from NUS. He's a fellow of the College of Alice and Peter Tan and also co-founder of our Singapore Reefs. And his talk title is uh, The Puffershi Fish, the Tub and the Cart a bit uh, mysterious, but it's going to tell, take us on a virtual dive in Singapore's water to tell us um, what looks in our, our seemingly calm waters. But uh, I will let uh, one point out also is that he's going to tell us the origin story of the latest science center batch, which is our... Uh, young marine biologists. Yeah, young marine biologists. So this is something that you guys might be interested. How did this come about and how did they actually create it? So if you're interested, uh, tune in on the 16th of July uh, to this talk. And the tickets are already available at the link. So thanks for joining us uh, once again. And thanks, Jess, for uh, giving us a brilliant presentation. And as usual, we're going to take a selfie at the end. So if you want, uh, turn on your cameras. Uh, we'll stop sharing our screen and we'll just take our selfie. Yep. This is the eighth uh, SG STEM talk, I think. Um, I've got to set this to gallery view. I see cameras coming on. Excellent. Oh, I see Desmond. I see Nat. Okay, so I'm going to just count down and just do a screenshot. One, two, three. And I got to go to the next. Oh, I think just we're just one page today. Excellent. I see Anbu as well. So Akan Dachang Anbu is, has agreed to be one of our speakers uh, as well. So we expect to hear her talk about uh, the work at Acres. Right, so uh, anything from you, Kanan? Uh, no, nah, I think that's all from me. Thanks for like, you know, setting aside your evening uh, every two weeks and joining us. It's been great. And uh, I think like, uh, it's really great. I think for those of you who missed the earlier announcement, uh, w, uh, SG STEM has so far raised uh, $1,020, not including today's one, for various charities so far. So uh, based on the government's dollar matching project, it will be doubled. So we have raised almost $2,000 thanks to you guys. So um, yeah, it's really good. And thanks for your support. And uh, hope to see you guys join for future sessions. Cause as for now, we do not have like a end date for us yet. So we're going to talk to us, man. And also it drop us quiz ideas and like quiz topics. Cause Marcus and I are pretty much scrapping the bottom of the barrel here now. So 
thank you. And uh, yeah, we'll try to do all quizzes and stuff. Yeah, and I yep, also that's see all from a me. new... Yep, yep, good night. I see Tom as well as Rupali on the screen as well, new folks. All right, have a good night. Catch up on the election news that we missed. Yeah, see you guys. Bye-bye. Have a good night.